My name is Daniel Ritchie, and I'm a recovering heroin addict, and this is my story. Uh, you know, I was born in um, August 22nd of 1981. I was born in Rochester, New York, uh, two loving uh, parents. My father was a, is a veteran and an Eagle Scout, and my mother was a Latin teacher. Uh, came to Cincinnati when I was two years old, and, um, you know, at a, at a young age, uh, I always had a lot of trouble fitting in, you know, uh, I always found a, some form of solution, whether it was fighting or sports, but, but being in academics was, was always a tough area for me. Didn't learn to read till I was about three or four, uh, or in, I'm sorry, in third or fourth grade. And uh, I struggled with uh, friendships, and um, I struggled with authority even at a young age, you know. Um, as time went on, uh, the struggle got worse, which I know is part of adolescence. But the difference was, is when I discovered alcohol at the age of 11, and I had my first drink, it gave me the feeling of, that I was fixed. And it's a tough feeling to describe at that age, but now being older, I know what it was. Uh, that uh, behavior started to escalate. It started to continue, started getting worse. The first time I ever got drunk with a guy, uh, we went out and we broke into about 100 cars. So... You know, I, I know that adolescence is something we all go through, the, the, what adolescence is. But alcoholism is when you have to put something in you. Addiction is when something changes you that you put inside of you and causes you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Uh, in seventh grade, I made some uh, friends that uh, probably weren't the best people to hang out with. But those were my people. Those were the people I felt like I fit in best with. Uh, they were the guys standing on the corners. They were the guys smoking. They were the guys selling drugs, smoking weed, and drinking alcohol. And that's what I wanted. That was the life that I wanted. You know, I was a very athletic kid, but uh, athletics took a back burner to, to something that was going to take me to another level, if you know what I'm talking about. And... Um, that started spiraling out of control in itself. I've always seemed to take things to the extreme, and I think that's a trait that addiction uh, gives a lot of us. And I started selling drugs. Um, by the time I was 15 years old, I was a convicted felon. By the time I was 16, I was sentenced to uh, do some serious time in, in the Department of Youth Services. Uh, served about two years in, a, in DYS at Cuyahoga Hills Boys School up in Cleveland. Got out a week after my 18th birthday and uh, realized at that point that I no longer wanted to live that way. But the, there was no solution involved. You know, I, I had been into rehabs. I'd, I'd been to anger management as a child, things like that. But, but I just thought it was a phase. I thought that that was something that was just, again, adolescence. Uh, I got real into exercise and working out when I was in DYS with a couple of guys. We would do, you know, a couple thousand push-ups a day. And I fell in love with, with, the, with the feeling I would get for that because it would change me once again. And uh, I started setting goals for myself. My first goal was I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a personal trainer. I worked for free for a company for about six months until they would hire me. And within two years, I was running that business. Uh, it ended up going down, but I continued that path of uh, personal training. I also uh, did some tough man contests and I got into um, mixed martial arts. I also did a couple of bodybuilding competitions. I uh, got second in the Mr. Cincinnati in the, like, the novice, division, novice division in 2002. And I got uh, first in a regional powerlifting competition. Um, and uh, I also, like I said, got into mixed martial arts, met a few guys. Uh, with that is kind of where this story really takes a different turn. Um, at that point, I had kind of put drugs and alcohol to the side. I still drank. I still, still smoked a little bit of weed. But it wasn't something that I let like take me to other places. 
And when I got involved in mixed martial arts and some of the guys I got involved with, they kind of activated that inside of me again, that, 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 that ego, you know, that, that feeling of belonging, that same feeling that I had as a child, now I had as an adult. And again, it seemed to uh, find its way back to the drugs and the alcohol. Uh, I started, um, you know, taking ecstasy and partying. I was working at a couple of clubs and meeting new people, and I was getting involved in the same group of guys that, that the same behaviors that I never dealt with as a child. And and as I um, started to use drugs and alcohol, I seemed to notice that I would use a little bit more than everybody else. And other guys would take three or four hits of ecstasy, and I would take like six, seven, or eight, and I would stay up for two or three days on this party and on this high. And uh, I would always get it under control after that. I would, I would take some time if I had a fight scheduled. I, I would focus on that. Uh, but I always struggled with the cravings of drug and out, drugs and alcohol. I had an addiction to women. Uh, you know, because as a child, women rejected me. I had acne as a kid, and not only that, but I spent a lot of time in, in institutions. And uh, I noticed that as I got older, uh, women were attracted to me, and I started to become addicted to women. I started using women as a drug. I started using it as a tool in my life to make me feel better about myself because I didn't really like who I was deep down. I was constantly trying to find that solution to me. What is going to make me happy you know and I and the only times I felt like I was happy was when I was either under the influence of drugs and alcohol or and I was under the influence of some kind of high from from a love situation um, or a sexual situation I got into stripping I was a stripper I started that when I was 18 years old also uh, just kind of as a part-time thing and uh, you know again with that came that same drugs and alcohol lifestyle uh, I, I always talk about this disease, this disease of addiction. This is a this is a progressive disease. It's not nothing that just hits you all at once. Maybe with some people, but for me, it was progressive. It started out with with weed, started out with alcohol, started out with Ritalin, and it took a little bit of a break, waited for its vulnerable time, and then it snatched me up again. Um, I uh, always found that solution in alcohol whenever I would go through a breakup. Whenever a family member died, that was my solution, and I think that's a common thing. But, but the uncommon thing about me was I always took it a little bit too far. Uh, when I was um, about 25 years old, uh, I was injured in a, in a fight. There was a fight I had. I ended up uh, br breaking uh, the joint of my shoulder. It's called a Brancard's fra fracture, and I had a torn labrum. And I ended up actually winning this fight. But the injury, when I went to the doctors, they loaded me up with Percocet. That was my first experience with opiates. Um, I noticed the first time I took a Percocet, it was my, it, it just, it was a feeling that I, I, is almost indescribable. It was something that, it made me feel like all this time I've been at this level or this level. And it put, brought me right where I needed to be. Like it made everything in life started making sense. I was able to put two and two together, so I thought. I was able to see a solution to my problems as soon as I put that inside of me. I can go to the gym today. I know I got a hurt shoulder, but I got another hand, an elbow, two knees, and two ankles. I can still train. You know, which sounds good in theory, but all that stuff is delusional to me. And, and the fact was, was that it became something that I needed every day. It became a solution that I needed, and, and it started to change me. I started to, to think a little bit differently. And again, I ended up checking this problem. Um, ended up realizing that this probably wasn't a good road to go down if I wanted to have a career as an athlete, or if I wanted to continue to have a career as a personal trainer. Um, as time went on, I, I kind of abused uh, uh, pain medication, but I usually was able to kind of get it under control at a certain point, uh, but it was always something that was in my life. You know, I had a fight where, you know, after I would get done fighting, I would tell guys, like, I want you to have two beers for me. I would stock up on drugs and alcohol, and I would have it all ready for me as soon as I, I, I got done fighting, whether I won or lost, you know. 
most of the time I won. But I, uh, I started to obsess about that over time. I had one fight where I ate, as soon as I, I walked out, it was a title fight, I won the fight. As soon as I walked out, I got my beers, um, started drinking, started popping pills. I don't even know what all I was taking. I ate a bunch of mushrooms, um, drinking a bunch, went to a couple of bars. People still gave me more drugs. Again, I, I didn't care what I was taking. Uh, I didn't know what I was taking. And I woke up kind of from a blackout in a Perkins restaurant with a girl that I'd been dating sitting across from me, totally terrified of whatever I was go going. And I was yelling at the uh, waitress for water. Uh, got back home and kept uh, waking up, choking on my own vomit. And I, I came to the realization that I was going to die. But I couldn't call anybody and tell them because I couldn't let them know what I've been doing. I made it to the sink in my, in my kitchen and there was some duct tape and I duct taped my arm to the faucet and I hung there until I was able to, uh, you know, function and not choking on my own vomit anymore. Uh, and that was something that I, I couldn't tell anybody. It was something that I, I took, sh uh, had some shame in, but not enough shame to change. It was just something that I did too much. Uh, I had, I, I got to the point too where, where as things started escalating, I would, I would be cutting weight for a fight and I would invite girls over and I'd invite some of my friends over who, who partied like I did and I would, they would all be smoking weed and doing coke and, and doing whatever and I'd be on my treadmill in a sauna suit cutting weight and going to the bathroom cutting weight because I would, I would put a heater in there and turn my bathroom into a sauna while they partied because that, that chaotic atmosphere and, and the drugs and the alcohol was something that I just needed to be around. I needed that in my life because it, it made me feel like I belonged again. Um, I, I was a personal trainer for, for a local company that was real big. This whole time I, was, I, I, was, I had the ability to be a part-time personal trainer so I could train full-time and follow my dreams. You know, I dedicated a lot of time to, to being a fighter and, and to being a mixed martial artist and, and I became a five-time champion in that process. But I was working for a personal training company, and one day, one of the, uh, the owners comes up to me, and he goes, hey, Daniel, we need you to re-sign some of your clients. If that's okay, we're kind of tied on some money. Uh, would you mind? And I was a subcontractor for this company, so all of my clients went through this company, and they paid me out. That was how it worked. I've been, I'd been working for them for six years. I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, three days, a couple days after that, Three or four days, they, they, they say, hey, Daniel, uh, we need you to sign this non-compete contract. It's been a while since we updated our paperwork. Uh, we need uh, the lawyers when all this stuff is that fine. And again, I had trust in them. Didn't think I was going anywhere. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. So I signed a non-compete contract. You have three days to cancel the contract in the state of Ohio. On the fourth day, they uh, found a way to let me go stole my business right off from underneath me. Everything I'd worked for as a trainer since I was 20 years old was gone. Um, I panicked. I, I wasn't sure what was next. Uh, I tried to call a couple of people and tell them that I, I wasn't doing very well. And um, they told me, Daniel, don't you have nothing to worry about? You'll be okay. You've dealt with tough times before, but I was not okay. And I remember getting off the phone with my brother and looking at my dresser drawer and knowing that I had uh, three Percocet 5s in my dresser drawer. And I went to my dresser, I, I opened it up, I pulled the mirror out, and I crushed them up, and I snorted them, and I sat back, and again, I had that feeling that there was a solution, that... That was my solution. Now, everything was going to be okay. I can figure this out. I've been here before. I have a plan. The problem was I needed that solution now every day. For some reason, it, it, that, that what happened with the training put me in a state of fear that only drugs and alcohol could take care of. So I'm drinking with it. I, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And and uh, I tried to start becoming a personal trainer. A lot of people offered help to me. 
a lot of people did offer me help, uh, let me train at their gym and things. And, and I was starting to get back on my feet. I got a full, I became a full-time bouncer. Uh, by the way, I've been bouncing at, at clubs since I was 21 years old. Also clubs and bars, uh, kind of went along, went along with the, with being the fighter lifestyle and I enjoyed it. And they, uh, Somebody offered me a job at a bar that was, it was a rough bar. They needed it, a, a little bit of help getting it under control. And I was the guy that they turned to and it was at a perfect time because I needed the work and it was a full-time job. It was four or five nights a week. I had another job at a, at a, at a club, um, uh, one or two nights a week. So I was like, I can make a full time out of this. I can do that and I can still train and fight. And, um, you, and you know, this whole time I'm taking Percocets, but I have some injuries, and and um, I end up being diagnosed with with a with a with a rare disease called Dupuytren's disease, which is where nodules form in the palm of your hands. And the younger you are, the more painful it is. And I'm 26 years old at this time, 27 years old. So to me, it was a very painful thing. I had trouble holding on to weights. I had trouble gripping, and I had trouble punching. Uh, so I had a hand surgery and again, Percocets and, and, uh, on top of that, I'm already abusing Percocets, but I'm justifying it in my mind because I'm an athlete. I need these things in order to compete. I need these things in order to go to work. I need these, but I don't know why people take antidepressants. Why not just take Percocets? It'll set you at the level you need to be. And that's how my mind was. Uh, I was working at the bar, and um, I, uh, my best friend, who became my best friend at that bar, uh, was the local drug dealer. And, you know, I started kind of trying to protect him, and he would hook me up with, uh, with drugs. And uh, plus, I'm getting my stuff from the doctor. I'm okay. I'm still fighting. I'm still doing everything that, that I want to do. My life is still feels like it's pretty good. It's not really unmanageable yet. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not still paying my bills somewhat. I, you know, they may be late, but they're getting paid. And I'm, and I'm getting my prescriptions. And what I, I'm not getting from my prescriptions, I'm getting from somebody else. Uh, well, um, things again started to escalate. My prescriptions weren't lasting long enough. I, I sought out a doctor that would write me uh, a big enough prescription, and he did. Um, and... I also went to another doctor because I wanted more because nothing, none, nothing was ever enough for me. You know, no girl was ever enough. No drugs are ever enough. No bottle of liquor is ever enough. And, and I, uh, ended up filling two prescriptions too close. Both doctors cut me off. And now I'm, I'm, I'm very fearful because I realized at this point after about a year or two of taking, uh, abuse and Percocet that I'm addicted and, um, I can't function without this. And I'm scared. Uh, I end up um, finding another old friend of mine who was uh, selling pain medication. And I started buying his. But now that I'm buying them on the street, my money's drying up a lot faster. I'm, run, I'm, I'm running out because I'm justifying it still in my mind that I have a fight, that I'm still able to fight. And I competed on, on, on Percocet. I, uh, the last fight that I actually had... I waited till they were calling my name out. I was the main event at a show, and um, it was I think it was in Indiana or Kentucky, and uh, I waited till they were calling my name, and I snorted two Perk Thirties off the top of the toilet before I walked out the fight, because I knew that I could time that right, and by the time that bell rang, I would be exactly where I wanted to be, and I fought well like that for a period of time. Now this guy that I'm buying Percocets from now on the on the street, he the Percocets are drying up, you know, and, and he's like, Daniel, all I got is 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 this other stuff. And I'm like, oh man, I can't do that. That's heroin. I can't touch that. I, that makes me an addict. I just need the Percocets because I need to train. I need to fight. He's like, nah, man, it's, it'll do the same thing for you. You'll still be able to compete. And uh, I'm like, okay, you know, I'll try it. And and the first and it and it worked. I was able to, to train. I was able to do what I wanted to do. It was, 
a lot harder to control to control but I was saving money because I didn't need as much but I know I could tell when I did too much I, I would fall out or I would get sick but I needed it I just needed it and um, I end up going to his house one day and, and him and his buddies are all sped up and they're playing video games and they're they got so much energy and I, I had, was was using Adderall at the time too uh, snorting Adderall. I love to. I love to stack drugs. I, I always have. I don't like to just do one thing. I like to, to mix them. I like to mix my Percocet with my Adderall, and then have a couple of drinks. I get on that perfect level. I'm able to associate. I'm able to feel, at the best that I can that I can feel. Um. And uh, he goes, Daniel, you don't want none of these. And I go, okay. And he goes, uh, this is called bath salts. <clears throat> And plant food was another name he used. And I'm like, really? I said, you're, you're snorting plant food and salts? And he's like, that's just what they call them, man. Just fine, try it. Do a little line. Did a little line. Loved it. Went down to the local gas station. Bought some. Mixed my heroin in the bath salt. And boom, now I was, I could take on the world. You know? I remember the first night that I did that, I stood on my porch and threw kicks till the sun came up. Um, but it, but just like any speed of that caliber, you don't, you're not going to sleep. And uh, you know, I, I would notice I, I was up for a few days, and I think the first run I had on it, I was out there talk, I was just laying on my couch talking to demons, and um, or what I thought were demons and shadow people, and telling them to come get me, and and uh, then I would go sleep it off, and and. I, I'm still trying to train at the time, and I'm justifying it because I wanted to, to drop weight classes. So if I use enough speed, all it's doing is helping me drop weight. I got it under control. I'm a champion fighter. There's nothing that could take me out. I got this. Well, I got scheduled uh, for another fight. It was a main event. It was the first show at, at Turfway Park called Turf Wars, and I was supposed to be the headliner. And uh, the promoter gave me a stack of tickets, said, do what you do, and I sold all the, sold all those tickets, and I um, and I spent all the money on drugs. Still showed up to fight. When I showed up to the weigh-ins, actually, let me let me back up. So when I showed up to the weigh-ins, uh, the they were asking me like, "Are you okay?" Because I weighed in ten pounds underweight, and um. I was, yeah, I'm great, you know, I'm sped up, I've been up for only for about two days at that point, still hadn't gone to bed, showed up to fight, uh, the doctors said no, they weren't going to let me fight, and uh, the promoter's asking for his money, and uh, I don't have it, and uh, I got up out of there, in a paranoid, delusional state, it was, it was really starting to hit me hard, and I went to a local bar, and uh one of the promoters called me, who actually ended up being a sheriff for Hamilton County, and he's asking where his money's at, where his money is at, and I hung up the phone and gathered my girlfriend at the time, my brother, and a, one of his friends, or one of our friends, and went back to my apartment, and um, I started getting really paranoid, and I ended up, uh, I, or I heard some, some motorcycles outside, some like ninja bikes, and I immediately thought, holy shit, this promoter sent ninjas after me. And so I, I, I blocked off the, the windows. I, I put tape around the door all the while. My, uh, my, my girlfriend and my brother and his friend are still in there. And I got down into my underwear and I strapped two samurai swords to my back and got my pistol. And I said, let them come get me. You know, a little bit of period of time passed. I told my girlfriend and uh, my brother and them to go ahead and, and go outside and see what was going on. And um, I remember that they did not come back. <laughs> and uh, that pretty much started a whole new, uh, whole nother, another chapter of, of the abuse of the speed and, and the opiates. This, this behavior has continued. You know, I, I, I truly believe that that the bath salts took me to another level. I got, I went, I started changing. I started collecting weird things. I stopped training around this same period of time. My heroin addiction is kicking up. I'm snorting heroin. Uh, I lost my apartment. 
I had my own gym. I lost the gym. Started selling my equipment right, under, right from under, underneath my students. Sold things that weren't mine. Also, uh, another thing that took me some time to come to terms with was I, uh, you know, I stole from my family. I, I broke into my parents' house and I, I stole pain medication uh, that my mom needed. I stole jewelry that was irreplaceable. And I sold those things and I spent the money on drugs. And my mom ended up detoxing in the house and, and falling and, and really hurting herself. You know, which took me a long time to come to terms with. But, you know, that's where my addiction was taking me. Uh, I had a girlfriend that, that, that rode this, this whole uh, train with me. I'm not going to talk to her about too much, but just she was there for the majority of this story. Uh, but I ended up homeless. And uh, I lived in a storage unit for a short period of time. And uh, to, while I lived in that storage unit, I took all the DVDs that had my fights on them. I took all my trophies, belts, medals, uh, anything that I had gotten through accomplishments that I've gotten all from all the way from bodybuilding, powerlifting, and fighting. And I, I, I crushed them all against the dumpster and threw them all away because they meant nothing to me anymore. I, I started spiraling into this, this dark place. And um, as time went on, it only got darker. Uh, you know, I, I just, it went from, I started driving. I still had my license. I still had a car. I had no place to stay, but that was fine. I could find places to stay, uh, even though I was inconveniencing a lot of people. And uh, ended up driving for drug dealers, ended up starting to run dope. I would uh, be at a, I, I, I worked at a, at a trap house, I would run dope for the guys down the stairs while I'm carrying a Glock with a uh, with a with a extended clip or magazine. Uh, I would I would hold a shotgun at the window while those guys would go out. Um, anything they needed, I would do because I needed what they had. Uh, I stopped contacting my family. I stopped contacting my friends. Uh, if you had nothing to give me, I wanted had nothing to do with you, and. I continued to use, and things continued to escalate. I ended up getting stabbed uh, twice, uh, shot at multiple times. I had a gun put to my head by a 16-year-old kid and had to drive around a building, and he decided whether he was going to kill me or not. And um, that was just another day in the life of, of, of addiction, you know. Nothing mattered as long as I could get one more in me. That's all that mattered. And now I'm using... Because I, I want to cover up the things that I've done using. You know, a lot of people don't think addicts feel guilty about the things they do. We feel guilty. We just don't know how, how, what to do about it, but continue to use to cover up the things that we're doing using. And that's where the vicious cycle starts. And I don't know how to get out. I'm, I'm, people are hating me. Friends aren't, aren't talking to me. I'm stealing from people. I'm stealing just to eat because I need every dollar that I'm getting to go to drugs, you know, to feed my addiction. I'm conning people out of money. My dad gave me, my dad was, God bless his heart, he was my biggest enabler. But he, oh, he, I don't think that he knew what to do like a, lot of, like a lot of the parents of us don't know what to do. A lot of people don't know what to do. And um, I would run everybody dry and I didn't care. Once you had nothing to offer me, I was done with you. Uh, my, my homelessness, uh, just continued to get worse. Now, now I, I don't have any money. I'm, I'm, I'm tapped out. I'm, I'm robbing drug dealers is probably one of the reasons I'm getting in so, so many problems. I, I, I robbed a drug dealer at the corner of, uh, McHenry and Westwood Northern Boulevard, which is a neighborhood here in Cincinnati and, uh, in a West, in a, one of our rougher neighborhoods. And I, I jumped out of the car in the middle of the intersection, um, because right before that, he told me he was going to take me down to the projects and let them deal with me because I had already robbed him once before. So he let me in his car and I robbed him again. So now i got people after me in the same neighborhoods that I'm running in. And now I'm just wishing death upon myself. I don't understand why I'm still here. And this, this just continued. Um, just got worse. I sh the first thing I ever shot up, I was at the bo in the bottom of a trap house in the projects. 
and I shot up cocaine and I threw up and I loved it. So I just shot up cocaine, why not shoot up heroin? So I started shooting heroin. One of the things I never thought I would ever do. Not only did I think I would never do heroin, but once I accepted that I was doing heroin, I'm never putting a needle in me. Uh, I shot up for so long and so often that all the veins in my arms collapsed and I was shooting in my neck. Tried to work jobs. I, I would get a few odd jobs, but I could never really function because I, I still needed that drug. And I, I would steal from anybody anyway because I turned into this thief that I never wanted to be. Uh, you know, it got to a point where every time that I shot up, I wanted to die. Like, I, I just, I thought I was too far gone. There was, I was just a hopeless drug addict, junkie, has-been fighter who's, who's ran dry, who's a piece of shit, who doesn't deserve a good life anymore. This is how I go. Um, and I had accepted that, but I didn't understand why I was still alive at the same time. My uh, dad had talked me into going to the addiction services here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and just talking to him. And I, he actually gave me money because I wouldn't go unless he gave me money for drugs, which is totally insane. But that's how, how deep my father's love runs for me. And uh, he uh, took me there, and I still don't think I was really willing to get help. R willing to get help. I, I found a way to manipulate myself out of that situation, too, until finally uh, I thought I'd had enough. I thought I would give it a shot. I went to treatment, and um, I stayed for seven days and convinced everybody that I, or thought I was convincing everybody that I was cured. I'm not one of you. I decided to get separated from the drugs a little bit. I have a job on the outside that I didn't really have. I had a place to go on the outside that I didn't really have either. And uh, within a couple of hours, I was back on the streets and I was high again. And I was like, how the hell did this happen? Um, ended up uh, going and staying with a couple of uh, prostitutes. And, and they kept me well. And, and I, I did was stealing from a Target and or Walmart and just trying to get gift cards and and I had a moment that I hadn't had before you know they call it a moment of clarity and and I sat back I remember sitting back in this hotel room there's blood splattered on the walls from pushing out the plunger of a needle and I was starving I hadn't eaten in one or two days and I remember going what happened how did I get here? And I started to get emotional. And I remember picking up the phone and I called the Center for Addiction Treatment here in Cincinnati. And I, I said, and I, exp I expected them to say, you know what, Daniel? You screwed up. You shouldn't have left. No, you can't come back. And when I called, the lady was like, <clears throat> like it'll be okay, baby. It'll be okay. We'll take care of you. And um, I hadn't had anybody be compassionate to me in so long. And I hated myself, and I didn't understand why anybody cared about me or was going to give me another chance at anything. All I did was disappoint. All I did was throw away every opportunity that anybody ever gave me. Took a week and a half to get back into the Center for Addiction Treatment. And uh, I needed every bit of that week and a half because... It was the worst time in my life. Uh, I was scared. I was sick. And I was hungry. And I couldn't afford food. And I'd burned every bridge. And I stood at the end of a street with a sign. And there was people I knew that drove past me and didn't even recognize me. People that looked up to me at one time and didn't even recognize me. And I wanted to die. I just wanted to die. And the center for and the cat house calls me and they let me in and, and I and I go through the detox and I'm like I could, I've detoxed I tried this on my own so many times and and I detoxed again and uh, I remember like the 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 first the last day of the, in the detox I was I was so like agitated and I couldn't sleep and my legs wouldn't sit still and 
and I and I was like, if somebody doesn't go out and smoke a cigarette with me, I'm leaving. And uh, the, the the nurse went and smoked a cigarette with me, which she didn't have to do. And it made me stay. And I stayed for one more day. And I stayed for another day, and I met a guy named Kenny who who was showing me friendship, which I hadn't had a friend in five years. And um, I, re- I had a tough time looking in the mirror because I didn't like what I'd become, and I didn't like the way I looked anymore, and, and I, I hated myself again. And he gave me some hair gel one day and said, Daniel, just gel your hair up. It'll make you feel better. And, and I gelled my hair up. <clears throat> I looked in the mirror, and I felt a little bit better about myself. And the next day, I shaved because I hadn't shaved in so long, and I went ahead and shaved, and, and I, again, I felt a little bit better about myself. And these people were coming into the cat house, and they're talking about hope, and they're talking about recovery, and, and that people are coming back from this. And, and I had no idea that people recovered from this. I thought this was the way it ends for us. That once you hit a certain point, you're too far gone, and there's no help for you. There's no, nobody will ever love you again. I remember sitting in this hotel room, and and sitting there and telling myself that no woman is ever going to want me again. No, my family is never going to forgive me. How could they for what I've done? My brother is never going to love me again because I'm not a very good uncle and I'm not a good brother and I don't deserve their love. I'm going to die alone. And um, there were other people that were telling their story and they were similar and they, they had felt the same way and now there was hope, that they had hope. And the first thing that was appealing to me, because whatever it is that appeals to you is all that matters. Whatever gets that seed planted in your mind is all that matters. And I saw these guys, and they were wearing Jordan shoes, and they were wearing watches, and they were smiling, and they were happy, and they, were, they smelled nicer than I did. And, and uh, they had their hair cut. And he, these were all things that I wanted, even though they were materialistic. I wanted them. How did they get them? And I found out that these people worked a program of recovery. What's a program of recovery? Well, you, you work with others and you, and you get people to help you walk you through a, 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 a program that has certain instructions or suggestions. So I started doing that. I started doing what others told me to do. And, and all that time, man, the, 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 the little glimmer inside of me started to light back up. You know, I had a dream when I was in the cat house. And in this dream... I was floating in the air and there was this lion laying on the ground. And I floated into this lion. And I woke up and I was the lion. And when I looked around in this dream, all I saw were, were there, was, there was these like, they looked like deers and jackals and hyenas and they were black and they had red eyes and they started chasing me. And I'm running and I'm running and I'm scared for my life. And then I remembered that I was a lion. And I turned around and I and I looked at them and I roared and when I roared they scattered and I don't remember what else happened in that dream but I know that when I woke up that day I'll never forget it I remembered that I was a lion that I was a champion that I've been through adversity and overcame many times in my life and this is just another one of those times this may be the toughest opponent that I've ever faced but I will face it head on and I know that with the right tools I'm capable of overcoming like I have many other times. And I started to take another outlook on my recovery, and I stuck around in a treatment program that I did not want to be in. I had told my counselor I was leaving by Thanksgiving. My dad wrote me a letter and said, Son, nobody wants to see you. You need to stay your ass there. And he was right. What have I done? All the damage I caused all those years, I think the two and a half, three weeks of recovery is going to fix that? No. No. I had to come to terms with that real quick. And I stuck around. And I realized I had nowhere to go. And everybody kept suggesting that I do this sober living thing. So I, with three days left in treatment before I'm getting released, I decided to take another suggestion and go into a sober living house, a halfway house, transitional house. Probably one of the best decisions in my recovery. Um, I had nobody. I had nowhere to go. And... Um, I went to this sober living house and I started to make friends again, you know. I made friends in treatment. And, um, you know, but I was able to continue those friendships. I liked the feeling, what I was getting. I knew that I had a long road ahead of me and I had to face it. 
And one of the greatest things I learned was that I don't have to face it alone. Because for a long time I was alone and I didn't see a way out. And I was starting to see that there was a light at the end of this tunnel and I didn't know what this light was, but there was something there and I could see it because others were doing it. And who were, how are they better than me? Like they're not. And they know they're not. They are me. Um, I stayed at the transitional home for about three months. Uh, moved out with a couple other guys in recovery. Um, they did not stay sober. I came home from work one night and one had pistol whipped the other one. He went to jail. The other one went to the hospital. And neither of them have made it back since. But I stayed sober. And I stayed clean. Um, got in a... Uh, dated a couple of girls, uh, had a couple of heartbreaks, but I stayed sober and I stayed clean. I met the girl that I'm with today. Um, you know, it was just supposed to be a, a thing. I Early in recovery, I was still trying to find myself. and um, She just, it just clicked. And, uh, you know, and she's one of the most amazing people that I've ever met. You know, I have to give her credit for that. She accepted me for my past, and she uh, she saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself yet. And, you know, I started working with others, and I, I discovered that, you know what, I am worth recovery. You know, and it wasn't something that I said to myself. It was something that others told me so often I be began to believe it. Um. Man, recovery has been an amazing journey for me. You know, on top of having things in my life, I, I, I was given a set of principles that I've been able to live by and have bettered my life. You know, for a long time, I blamed God every time something went wrong, but I never thanked Him when things went right. I never had faith that He would carry me through like I have today. God has, I've seen God in my life like I never thought I would, and I would never thought that I'd be the one sitting in front of you talking about God. But I've seen His works. He works through me. He works through you. He works through our families. He works through our children. He works through the community leaders that are stepping up to try to do something about this epidemic that we're facing now. And today I have the ability to reach out and help others and show them that there is hope. Because I know what it's like to feel hopeless and I know it feels like nobody is listening and nobody cares, but I promise you that they do. You know, I have a 14-month-old daughter. I remember sitting, like I spoke about, sitting in that hotel room thinking no woman will ever want me. I don't have a family. They'll never forgive me. I have more love than I've ever had in my life today. Not only does my mother tell me how proud of me she is and how much she loves me, but I have this daughter that looks at me like I'm her world, and if I keep doing the right thing, she will never have to see her father stick a needle in his arm. My, I, I have a loving woman who loves me for who I am. I was homeless. Now I got a $125,000 home. I had 12 driving under suspensions. I have a license back. I have a car. And people want me in their life today. Because I followed a few simple principles that were displayed in front of me as a program of recovery to follow that others did before me. There was a, there was a, pay, a paved path of success laid out in front of me, but it was up to me to take it. And when I took the action, every step got a little bit easier. And I learned more from the hard days than I did the easy ones. And I'm grateful for those hard days. I'm grateful for that time that I spent on those streets today. I'm grateful for the harm that I caused myself because it gave me the resistance and it gave me the training to grow, to find my true purpose in life. And I feel today that I found that and it's within helping others find hope from this, this hopeless addiction that's, that's destroying our country, that's destroying our families. That is my recovery. I helped them start a program. I was able to be a part of starting a program at, uni at, at sorry, at a level one trauma center here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I've been able to grow that and get dozens of people into treatment and show them that there is hope like someone once did for me. You know, and, it's, and, it's, and God willing, it's going to turn into a full-time position. People actually want me today. They value my struggle. 
I thought that the struggle was going to destroy me, and it, it, and it made me. It made me today. I'm only able to come in front of this camera and speak today because of that struggle. Because I have a story to tell, and hopefully my story can help you. Can, hopefully my story can be part of the survival guide for your life. Because I'll tell you what, if you're watching this, whether, whether you are in addiction, whether you have a family member in addiction, or whether you're, you're just watching it for entertainment, just know that whatever you're going through, there's hope out there. You know, there's others who have gone through what you've gone through and are willing to share their experience to help push you through. I've, spoke, I've, I've had the pleasure to speak in front of city council. You know, I, I, was, on, I was on the news a few weeks back. I've been on, on podcasts. You know, I've, I get people that reach out to me, want me to be, help, help me with their path of recovery. Like, how does that happen? God. That's how God works in my life. I don't need to see a bearded man in the cloud. I just don't even know what he is, but I know he's there. You know? We've lost too many people. My best friend in treatment, Kenny, the guy that gave me the hair gel, passed away. You know? I've lost a total of 18 friends to this disease. You know, we've all lost loved ones. It's what are we going to do about it? You know? So I just hope that somebody out there is inspired by my story and I will continue to share it. And just know that you're not alone if you're suffering. That there is help. You can reach out. We are here for you. I made, this, I made it through this so that I can be there for you and help you through this. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me today.